Once again, live from the American Bible Society, it's uh, Kevin McCullough, AFA Today on AFR Talk. And for the uh, stations that are listening and for those of you watching by way of the American Family Channel, we're glad to welcome you to uh, Columbus Circle here in Manhattan. It's kind of a, a big deal if you ever get to Manhattan to, to be in this area. But the American Bible Society, an institution on this street corner, and really we're from their atrium, but what a uh, beautiful kind of relaxed setting to come and use iPads to study the Bible. It's, a, it's an incredible thing. I'll tell you more about that coming up. But I'm really excited to welcome my next guest back to the Kevin McCullough microphone. Uh, the last time we spoke formally, Senator, you were a candidate for president. And uh, <laughs> a few things have happened I did, I, in your remember, life since I, then. I remember doing that. Uh, it was a little bit of a blur, but I remember doing it. How's that. life outside of politics? Uh, I'm enjoying it a lot. It's a, um, you know, it's a whole new whole new deal but it's a it's something that is um, to me equally as important in trying to uh, to shape the future of our country um, congratulations by the way on the Christmas candle we're going to talk about your role with echo light and the passions of your heart that are driving you forward but I would just be crucified by my audience if I didn't ask you a couple of questions about sure. what is going on in sure. DC uh, Obamacare uh, you know it's a disaster and you know you want to talk about Frustration is frustration seeing uh, what I knew would happen right. because Obamacare is inconsistent with the American experience. It, it's, I always say that people who are experiencing the government in their lives in such an intrusive way, in a way that's bumbling and a way that is uh, uh, injurious to them, now they have an understanding of how most people who deal with the government on a regular basis, the business community, now they understand why they're so frustrated and mm -hmm. they're pulling their hair out. Because this is what the government is like with the people who have to interact with it on a regular basis. And like it or not, the financial sector, the business community, you know, people who want to try, who, who create jobs in this country are the ones who have been, been being beaten down by the government on a variety of different fronts. Well, the average, you know, the average American doesn't really have that interaction. Right. Now you're seeing it. Now you have an understanding, a little bit of an insight as to why people are so angry and frustrated with what's going on in the government, because they they simply are just, you know, they're they're just they're they, you know, they, they instead of doing surgery, they do it with a meat cleaver. And it's it's <laughs> just it's just horrible. And uh, and that's the that's the good thing that comes out of the bad thing is people are being hurt. And it's a really bad thing. Uh, and, 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 and it's not going to get any better. This website is not the problem. Yeah, right. it's a problem, but they're, they're not going to get this website fixed on time. They're not going to get the back end of the website. When, in other words, the information going to the insurance companies, I've talked to several insurance companies, all tell me the same thing. They're getting garbage. In other words, they're getting data that makes no sense of people that supposedly signed up right. with seven different addresses, eight different wives. I mean, it's, it's, it's nonsense data. And so people are going to sign up, think they have a plan, and then they go to the insurance company and say, we don't have any information. I mean, we don't have you. So, uh, and then once you get through that, you're going to see fewer doctors, less hospitals, higher deductibles, higher premiums. It's not dwindling services, dwindling services um, and lines. Some people have uh, made a big deal about the navigator program that is designed to sign people up into this because the website's not working and the corruption that are going that's going on in that were you one that was that was talking about the need for background checks and maybe not giving handing over piles of personal information to potential criminals that were uh, going to be uh, the doorways into this program? You know, the, the, there are, the reason you're having to do that is because of the way Obamacare is set up. It's not something that you have to do when you get your health insurance. You right. don't have to sign, give all that information. But you do now because the government wants to subsidize people, and so they have to know everything about you as to whether you qualify for the subsidy. So it's not about getting insurance. It's about redistributing wealth. And the only way you can redistribute wealth is we got to know everything you got, and we got to know everything about you. In other words, to, to make sure that you're fairly getting your subsidy and to make sure that we're sticking it to the people as much as we can. And of course, what the 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 worst thing about is they're exempting their friends, right? right? Yeah, I know. Saw today in the paper that the labor unions are now going to be exempted hmm. from some of the taxation. They're going to be exempted from some of these things. This is this is crony capitalism. This is this is what destroys free markets. So it destroys initiative because it's the government picking winners and losings, paying off their friends, penalizing their enemies, investigating them auditing them it's 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 the worst of all possible worlds. senator ted cruz's filibuster doesn't look half as crazy now 
The filibuster doesn't look crazy. The strategy behind the filibuster was crazy, in my opinion. I mean, it turned out that that he started a plan that may have made sense, but when it, it didn't, when it created, which it did, and I don't think it should have, but it did create a circular firing squad where a bunch of Republicans started attacking him instead of attacking Obama, then you have to step back and say, yeah, the fight's a good fight, but that's not what's happening right now. What's happening right now is all the media's covering is our fighting, and we have to sort of step back and try to get together so we can focus on exactly what the problem is right, right. now, which was the disaster Obamacare But is. I think now that it got to that level, I think some people are going to say, hey, he was at least trying to stand up for us He was at and the end of the day. No, look, I... The, the point he was trying to make, which is to make Obamacare the central issue of the break, of the August break this summer, was the exact right thing to do. And when people went out and attacked him for doing it, it was the exact wrong thing right. to do. The problem is, is any, any leader, any general knows that, you know, you go out and you have your game plan, and then the enemy, sometimes it's, it's friendly fire. In this case, it was friendly fire. They weigh in, and you have to change your plan. And the problem with Ted was not the plan but that he didn't adapt the plan to the situation that happened, and that ended up with a little bit of a disaster. Circumstances on the ground. That's right. Uh, We're talking with uh, former senator and former presidential candidate uh, Rick Santorum, and he is the president and uh, head of Echo Light Studios, which is the uh, studio that is uh, promoting and distributing the the brand-new Christmas film called The Christmas Candle. Uh, I still want to get to your life as a a movie exec, but I want to ask you, uh, 2014 and 2016 are around the corner. Do you miss not being in the, in the in the blow by blow? Do you want? Do, is there is there a piece of you that itches to get back in? Uh, I don't miss being in the United States Senate. Uh, <laughs> well, it was such a friendly receiving place for you when you yeah, were there. They loved, they loved me. Well, no, I got along pretty well with people. I mean, I, look, I was a I was a confrontational guy. I did a lot of things that that got people upset, and I had some people who were not you know not friendly, but. You have to realize that you know it's important to get along with people and to be civil and to and to uh, uh, you know, build relationships because, it's like in any business, I mean, politics is is not just about the bills and not just about the principles, but it's also about it's a human interaction and and you don't want people to oppose you because they don't like you. I mean, it's hard enough if right. they don't agree with you. You don't want them to have the extra incentive. But the by disagreements not you. become the basis of the not liking you, yeah, and then it, it gets really ugly, especially from the left. But it doesn't have to be. That's that's the that's the problem. It really doesn't have yeah. to be. And and we we've, we've gotten such such you know so much acrimony. And look, I people will go back and say, wait a minute, you did it too. And the answer is yes, I did. Uh, you uh, needed to. Yeah. You and, were fighting for people like me that felt like we had no voice in the Senate. And, but at the same time, if you go back and look at the record got a lot of things accomplished you did. because I was, you know, I was willing to sit down and say, okay, let's see what we can get done. And, and do I get everything? No, I don't get everything. That's not the way it works in life. I mean, if you're married, you know that, right? right. Uh, you're lucky to get something if you're married. <laughs> but but it, it, for me, I was always willing to take most of, the, most of it in order to move the ball forward. And I think we have to have that sensibility that it's not an all or nothing game. As long as we're moving the ball in the right direction, look at welfare reform, for example, we didn't get everything we wanted, but boy, we got a lot and we changed lives and we moved and we, and we, you know, we saw the benefits of, of uh, getting rid of government dependency. Those are the things that I think we need to, uh, again, temper the enthusiasm. We have to have the enthusiasm, we have to have the commitment, but you also have to have the reasonable expectation of trying right. to move the ball. Life in the movies. What does Senator Rick Santorum think about life in the movie business? Uh, people say, you know, you've given up and you're, you know, you've, you've abandoned the fight. And I, my answer is no, I'm just on another front of the fight. Right. Uh, I'm still involved with Patriot Voices, our, our political operation, PatriotVoices.com. But I'm, uh, I realize that the popular culture has a huge impact on what's going on in this country and therefore a huge impact on what goes on in, in D.C. If you look at particularly the moral culture issues in this country and, ha- and how they have changed over the past 50 years, driven largely by, by story, largely by folks who are out there telling folks what is good, what is true, what is beautiful, what is right, what is wrong, that are inconsistent with the values that I believe in. Right. And you do it enough, and we see it. Even, even young believers in America have very different viewpoints than our generation does about certain issues. Because that's all they see when they turn on the TV. That's all they see in their game shows. That's well, there's all another part of that problem in that the pulpit is not reinforcing what it should be. And I don't even get me started on that no, point. No, I understand that. But, yes, you're right. And the culture is the number one 
influencing yes. uh, method of, of, of social movement in, in, in creation. I, we've never had anything more powerful. No, and, and, and even more powerful today than it was in the past. I mean, it, you know, the Greek philosophers said, give me the storytellers and I will control the, the, the country in a generation. Well, that's when they were just telling stories orally. I imagine now the, the technology of what they can do to your brain right. with all these special effects and all the music and all these multimedia presentations has a much more profound impact on your soul. Mm -hmm. it, it penetrates deeper than, the, than the, the written word or the spoken word. And as a result of that, they, you've seen this transition happen very, very quickly because they took the, they took the methodology that's available to them and try to influence that soul. And believers have taken a position of plain defense, passcoding their TVs and their internet sites and, you know, limiting what their children can see on, uh, in the movie. By necessity. By but necessity, but look, we have the truth. We shouldn't be playing defense. Right. We should be playing offense. Absolutely. And, and the offense we played, in, in, you know, has not been particularly effective. We haven't gone out and produced the quality films that have been produced on the other side. And now that's changing. Yeah. It, but it needs to look. If I said Christian music to you 50 years ago, what would you think? <laughs> Bill Gaither, uh, right? And I mean, the Imperials. Yeah. yeah. Well, well yeah. but I mean, it would. It's basically gospel music. Yeah. But look at Christian music today. It is vibrant. It is alive. It is good quality, and it's in every genre. You say Christian film. You know, you can point out some good Christian films. Right. Don't get me wrong. You can. But they're not very many, and 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 if you say, well, are they as good quality as as uh, you know as as Iron Man? Well, of course not. They're not. They're not the high budgets. There may be some good good stories, but not 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 what the uh, secular world is doing. Are we going to do that overnight? No, but it's happening, and that's well, what I want to give people people hope. It's for happening. for whatever amount of crazy comes with it. Mel Gibson and the Passion. Yeah, uh, broke, It was the watershed for and us. I agree with that. And when it and when it broke through. A lot of filmmakakers uh, and I my business partner Stephen Baldwin yeah. and I we run a media company that is has a vested interest in this um, people started going hey this can be done and it can be done at the highest level possible now I want to get to your film because this is a sweet Christmas film you said in in talking to the uh, press before we uh, screened it today that uh, you you've teared up in different places at it and I thought <laughs> Santorum's a wuss, yeah. you know. And then I'm, I'm not John Boehner. Hold on. Now. And, and then I'm sitting there in the middle of the uh, in the middle of the scene in the church, and I'm oh, just like it's something. just weeping, and yeah. it was just messing with it's me beautiful. big time. Congratulations on making a, a heartfelt piece of media. But what do you like about this film the most? Um, I like the fact that people can relate to it. Yeah. Because these are flawed people. They're like us. I mean, these are these are people who are struggling with the everyday of life. Who uh, who have abandoned their faith because of personal tragedy. And look, I've, uh, I've been blessed in my life, but just like everybody else, we've had times when we doubted whether God was here. And you know, how can you do this to me? How can you really be here? Yeah. And we had a minister in this case go through that. And uh, you have, you have you know, the strong-willed woman who's, uh, you know, who's trying to, you know, who can, whose life is good and she's just, you know, everything is okay and she wants to get out of this little small town who are, you know, these, these people believe in faith and miracles and she's just sort of past that. And she realizes that, you know what, li life happens and not everything is going to go smoothly. And when that happens, you know, what holds you together? I think she says at one point, she goes, I'd like to believe. There's a lot of people in America who would like to believe, but they just can't get there because... Well, it's just, it's just, it's just not real for them. Yeah. It just hasn't, hasn't, hasn't connected with them. And I think people who see that, I, one, one woman who saw this, I don't know whether Max shared this story or not, but one woman who saw this movie in one of our screenings got up and afterwards and she said, I'm not a religious person, but after seeing this movie, I don't want to go another day without faith. Hmm. I think there's going to be a lot of people who may not stand up at the movie theater or go home and say that. But a few weeks, a few months, maybe even a little longer than that, that seed will be planted and, 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 sh and they'll see maybe the second time they see it. Because this is a movie I have no doubt that this will be a classic. This will be one that you'll see every Christmas because it's just it just hits home. And, what did and the Santorum beautiful. children say about this movie? They loved the movie. They they uh, they were, you know, we've. As you know, when you're the head of a studio, you get to see a lot of movies. And, <laughs> and so movie night in our family is, is, is a little different than everybody else because we're seeing, you know, rough cuts of right. all these different movies. Now, we saw it in a rough cut version without 
the the hymn with the miracle hymn, the, the soundtrack, Bulls, the soundtrack, yep. and the soundtrack is well done, really well done, yeah. and the music, the the song uh, is really. So we didn't see any of that. They like the movie. I can't wait for them to see it. They haven't seen it yet okay. in, in the theater. So I'm waiting for them to see it in the theater to get the experience. They liked the movie. They thought it was sweet. They, you know, they 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 liked the characters. You know, we we talked about it. We saw uh, one of our sons in the movie. I mean, we just say, said, "Boy, that's Peter. That's our son Peter." And that's so we again the the beauty of it is the you can identify yeah. with the characters in this film, and and that's uh, that was really special. We're short on time, Senator, but thank you for being with us. Let me ask you one last question, and I know that my listeners would be absolutely remiss if I didn't put this can to I, you. Can I do that before you do that? Sure. It opens Friday. Yes. We didn't say that. TheChristmasCandleMovie.com. <laughs> That's right. TheChristmasCandleMovie.com. The Christmas it's on 400 screens, and we did say that when Max okay. was here. I just we want to keep remind reminding people. Yeah, it's because, it, it, did Max tell you, it, oh, you know this. I'm sure you've told your, your folks, opening weekend is. We, we need it to do well. It has to do and well. And then we want to reverb it all over the country exactly. after that. Yeah. Exactly. How is your baby girl? Bella is awesome. You know, there's a song in the movie called there's a mir- miracles all around right miracles here to be found yeah i think of my girl yeah tons of my people are praying for her praying Thank for you. you praying for your family she is she is a miracle and and, and i can attest miracles all around. we love you we appreciate you we appreciated your faithfulness in the senate we're even more excited to see what god has for you and uh, friends, it opens this weekend. Please go see it. Uh, get as close as you can to a screening of it. Uh, and tell your friends about it. TheChristmasCandleMovie.com. Uh, Kevin McCullough. And uh, we're live from the American Bible Society. Thank you to them for hosting us today. Uh, Senator Rick Santor, Max Lucado, and Jim Harrelson, my guests. We'll see you tomorrow right back here on the American Family Radio Network.